Hey, hey, welcome into the Big Ten Huddle. I'm your host, JR. We're here to talk about all the things going on in the Big Ten, brought to you by the College Huddle with two of our College Huddle mates here, Ryan Evan from Keeping It Orange and Blue and Russ from the Boiler Express podcast. Russ, we got some of your Boiler Express guys in the uh, chat there. You want to say uh, howdy to your guys? What's up, fellas? Uh, I told him I was coming on here, and we didn't do a pod last night, so they're they're probably going to comment a little heavier than normal tonight. So, yeah, yeah, I love it. I, I love it. Glad they're here. And uh, yes, Dylan, uh, Russ, Russ did get a new mic. We're very excited about it. We're we're glad to <laughs> have it here first. And on I just do I need to step my like game up and get a mic because I just have always done my show without one. But you like, sound great, you, Ryan, you sound great, dude. I, so say, I got like, peer pressured. I got peer pressured. Don't feel like you need to do it. Like my whole podcast, there's five of us over there. Obviously, we're a big crew. And all four of them have had this nice, shiny, sure mic. And they've given me a hard time about it for like the last six months. And so I finally gave in and got it. Okay. Well, I'm glad me and Kevin both don't have mics. So I think it works. So there's no peer pressure. I just wanted to make sure, you know, if I, you know, I don't want to be the only guy that's like no mic for that guy. So it's all good. But uh, Ryan, this is just what happens when you get on a podcast with like five guys and uh, you're all just talking all the time and you have to talk over each other. You have to make sure you have the best mic to talk over each other. That's how it works. Oh, okay. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm going to have to, I've actually watched a few of your guys' episodes. I think you guys do a pretty good job, you know, you know, as, as, as good as, as good as some Boilermakers can do, can do. There it is. There it is. Yeah, yeah. That's what Just talking. fun. All in fun. You guys, me and Russ get along very well. And we have a thing that we only get on this with JR. If we can do it together. <laughs> Absolutely. I love it. <laughs> I love it. Hey, we got some good stuff to, to discuss. Uh, our first topic is going to be a little sad. So uh, I know me and Kent were talking about it Saturday night. We had Russ and Dylan on. But uh, Purdue, unfortunately, falls to UConn 75-60 to 60 on, what was it, Monday night? I can't even remember yep. anymore. It was so Monday late morning. at night. I was, you know. Or Tuesday morning, something like that. <laughs> Basically yeah. Tuesday morning. So yeah. um, I, we can talk all day long about how national championship game shouldn't start at 9 30 at night on a monday but whatever i'm sure everybody's already discussed that russ man we'll go to you first uh your thoughts on the game overall yeah so i mean it obviously didn't go the way we would have wanted it to as purdue fans but it honestly was i mean it was the greatest season we probably ever had especially in our lifetimes and uh yeah dylan yeah there's it's a sore subject i think that was half the reason we didn't do a podcast last night we usually go live every tuesday and i think people were just like we need a break it's been a long run it's been a long season you know it's it's a long season when you're you know doing a podcast you're following the team so i can't imagine how long it was to them to go three extra weekends uh, after everybody else is done and i mean transfer portal is already starting coach talk is already starting and we're like hey we still got two more games hopefully two more games but right. uh it was i mean they left it on the court you know, Edie did not, you know, disappear. You know, I, I know people can say, well, he's a one-man show, 37 out of 60 points. But, he, you know, we aren't there without Lance Jones. We aren't there without Braden Smith. We aren't there without, you know, Fletch, TKR, Mason Gills, those guys. Like, it's it's still very much a team effort this last year with the Boilermakers. But it was just – it was great to see him there. I mean, it was – it's a monkey off the back. We've made a Final Four. And the feeling in the fan base is very much that – this won't be it for Painter. You know, Painter's only 53, right? You've got Izzo still out there coaching at 69. Underwood, who's one of the, you know, up-and-coming coaches in the Big Ten, he's 60. You know, mm -hmm. so Painter's still got a lot of great years ahead of him as long as he wants to keep doing it and doesn't decide, hey, I've made a Final Four, I'm going to retire after a year or two. But uh, we've got a great class coming in next year. We've, we're bringing back a lot of great pieces from this year's team. So it, it's really a sense of optimism, like disappointment, but a lot of optimism and thankfulness for, for how the season went, for sure. <clears throat> and um, from a an opposing, you know, Big Ten school perspective, and a, you know, it was funny just watching the two teams that gave Illinois the roughest goes all year were in the national championship. So it was really like we were feeling pretty good about our program with you know seeing you know the two teams that you know because only no only one team beat Illinois by double, double digits, which was UConn, but they beat everybody by double digits. So, yeah. you know, that's just how, how it went. Um, and as much as we want to talk about the 30 and 0 run, I know, I know, because that's what everybody gives me crap about, but just watching, you know, Purdue, I was, you know, pleased and happy to see, you know, ED go out playing like that, which was great. I think, um, you know, Klingon did a pretty decent job on him, but you know, he got his points plenty and it sounded like Hurley was, 
okay with that. They just wanted to take everybody else away, which was, which, which, by the way, easier said than done. You know, like Illinois tried that in the second one. And in the second half, Smith and Lawyer were hitting their shots. It was a shame, really. You know, I was okay if, with, with a Big Ten championship. I, I think the conference needs to win one here in the next few years. So get all this Big Ten can't win the big one crap off off of uh, everybody's tongue because that's what it seems to always be. Um, so seeing Smith and Lawyer and some of the other guys kind of – well, Smith not necessarily, but from deep, it just seemed like nothing – even Gillis was struggling, you know. Like Gillis always had those big threes throughout the year. It just didn't seem to be their night, sadly. And, you know, UConn doing something that no other team has done in the last 16 years. So, you know, you got to tip your hat. They were just a buzzsaw, man. And uh, I think that's just – at the end of the day, how I looked at UConn and, and Russ, I think you guys had a great chance to win the game. But I think that anybody who had UConn in their bracket was just kind of unlucky until you had to play. You know, you, until you had to play them. You know, it was just kind of like it was their it was their year. It was their they were the best team in the, the, the country. So I feel like if if you played UConn, your season was ending in, in March Madness. So, but you guys have so much to be proud of. Um, I am. I will say. Are you were you expecting Mason Gillis to hit the portal? Was that kind of not surprising to you? Because the Ethan Morton to me from the outside was not a shocker because he really didn't get to play a lot, you know, the second half of the season or maybe towards the end. He just looked like he was just a guy that was, you know, getting, you know, garbage minutes or maybe foul trouble minutes. So what was the Mason Gillis transfer portal stuff? Does that surprise you? Uh not I mean, not really, especially when Ethan Morton did it first, but you know, Purdue's in a scholarship situation where we were oh, we were one over the limit going into next season, and that's without without Ethan Morton, without Mason Gillis, without Ed using a COVID year. So we weren't expecting them back. I think it was a bit of a shock that they went transfer portal, but I'm happy for them as long as they don't go play for you know Illinois or Indiana or somebody that we're gonna have to face this next year. That that's fine. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, I, uh, I, I wasn't surprised by Ethan Morton. I actually thought maybe Caleb first. Might have yeah. entered the transfer portal as well, it's, but it's, it's, it's not did surprise me. I was about to yeah. say there's still time, Jr. <laughs> well, yeah, I guess so. something's gonna have to give. Like I said, we're over the limit by one, so you know, a, a freshman's gonna have to decide. An incoming freshman's gonna have to go to prep school, or you know, one of these guys is gonna have to give up a scholarship, or somebody's gonna have to transfer that is an underclassman or not a senior going into next year. So, uh, Philip asked first go in portaling. I wasn't saying he is. I was just saying if it was. Like, I knew one person from Purdue was going to have to, so my thought was maybe first or more. And I guess, like like these guys said, he still could potentially go portaling, um, but I'm not necessarily predicting that to happen. Um, okay, let's talk about Twitter, because Twitter's dumb, okay? Zach Eady had a fantastic game. End of story. Zach Eady is the best player in college basketball this year. Terrence Shan Jr. is number two, and Dalton Connect is number three. All right? End of story. Zach Eady played like the best player in college, in college basketball this year, and he had a fantastic game. Unfortunately for him, Fletcher Lawyer and Lance Jones didn't have the game that you would like them to have. Braden Smith, I think, had a good game. It wasn't great, but it was a good game. I think he did what he had to do for the team to win, and unfortunately, when you just don't get the production from Fletch and Lance, and uh, I mean, Cam Heidi had a dunk that will rock everybody's TV screens for... <laughs> I wasn't even sure it went in live. Like what happened live, I was like, did that go through the hoop? Did that really like holy I didn't like, know Cam Heidi had that in him, dude. He's he's had some pra- crazy above the rim plays this year. So it didn't I knew he had it in him, but it just kind of came out of nowhere. It's like sometimes he makes a play like that and you're like, Oh, I didn't see him get subbed in. That's crazy. How's their but, how's uh, Purdue's class next year? They've got I know I've seen they've got I think a couple four stars, right? Like, yes, we've got six we've got six committed, right? And I think there's three that have a really good shot at contributing at a pretty high level. Um, you know, one or two, Kanan Catchings or Jakari Harris could actually start for us possibly. So we're we're reloading pretty well next year. Yeah. Okay. And then there's gonna be Kaufman Wren. Yep. Kaufman, Kaufman Wren, Fletch, uh Braden Smith. Yeah. Who are the other two you think is the Sam Heidi, Miles Colvin. Oh, yep. as far as Oh yeah, but uh, I thought you were talking about incoming freshmen, like the recruiting class. Yeah, well, like, yeah. Uh, I was asking. You said two of those guys could have been starting, and so I was listing off the for sure starters. Oh but... yes, yeah. I'd say the three that started this year that are coming back for sure, and then I think Cam and Miles will will challenge for a starting spot. But I think Jacobson, Harrison, um, Catchings could all be in the mix for a starting spot as well. It just kind of 
kind of depends on what goes on and if anybody else transfers you know going in this summer we'll see what happens so very cool very cool uh russ going back to zach ed so zero assists in this game uh, i heard some chatter about it like maybe he could have done a little bit better passing in this one i i mean cam spencer was doubling him at times but i still felt like there wasn't really anything Edie could do because the rotations, I mean, literally UConn, it was like all their guys had ropes around their waist and they were just moving as one unit the entire time. It was incredibly impressive the way they were able to rotate on the perimeter. And even when Edie had some possibly open passes across the court, it still felt like they were in good enough position that they weren't exactly open and you weren't going to get a good shot from that. So, I mean, in your opinion, Russ, do you feel like Zach Edie could have passed a little bit better or do you not really put any fault on Zach Eady and say the dude scored 37 points. He did what he had to do. Yeah. Yeah. Not really. Um, it, the, the way they doubled was different than what some other teams double when like NC state was doubling. The natural thing is to just wall up two dudes in front of Edie and make him shoot over you. Right. But the way that especially Cam Spencer was doubling was he was kind of almost flashing back and forth, like going in and taking a swipe and then getting back to his guy, going and taking a swipe, getting back to his guy. And a lot of times he either would get a steal or, or cause a turnover or he would get called for a foul. So it wasn't like a true – it wasn't a doubling like we've seen a lot this year, a ton this year. And they did an amazing job of rotating back to shooters to the point that, like, in the first half, the the three-pointer that Mason Gillis attempted, he didn't even get to the rim because he got stuffed because they were that on top of our shooters. And I think they didn't even count it. Like, at halftime, they were talking about Purdue only attempted two three-pointers, whether well, it would be a nice to Mason Gillis because they didn't count his as an attempt when they were talking about it at halftime. But they were just honest from three. And – you know, Edie, that's the, the game plan that like Michigan State's used against us the last few years, right? That's why Edie's averaged like 30 plus points get against Izzo and Michigan State because they play the let Edie get his and stop everybody else. The thing is, Edie usually shoots a little bit better and we still have some openings. We find openings for three point shooters because he just missed a few that he could have made. Like he still shot on his average. I think he was like 62 or 63 percent in the game, but there were still two or three that he could have, he should have made and he was mad at himself for missing that if he makes those, it might change the dynamic of, of the way UConn played him. They might have to double a little bit harder, and it opens things up a little bit more for shooters. And then we had several misses like that that somehow we'd miss at the rim, and then UConn gets a run-out layup somehow. Like, they were just transitioning very well. And it it wasn't, you know, this is where I might get into some of the, the Twitter uh, interesting things, too, after that weren't just about either, that people just chirping, like Illinois fans, Tennessee fans, people chirping about, oh, see, you, you really weren't the best at all. You just got – you got lucky because you didn't play UConn to the final game. And, oh, really, we, the only difference is UConn didn't shoot as good from three against as, as you can shoot as they did against Illinois. That's the only difference. And it's like, no, it was a completely different game. Like, they didn't go on a, a 30-0 run. The biggest point stretch they had, I think, was like eight points from the first half to the second half. It was just like they'd score four, we'd hit a bucket. They'd score five, we'd hit a bucket. You know, they'd score – you know, it was just a, it was a slowly methodical – them pulling away from us and we just couldn't get them to stop hitting shots. And that's why I think why the UConn team was so hard to beat this year was they never went cold. It seemed like they always had somebody. And a lot of times they were difficult shots. They hit some runners. They hit some contested threes in that game that you're just like, man, there's no way they can keep hitting those, but they just kept scoring the ball. I mean, the, the game against Alabama was a good example too. It seemed like kind of similar games a little bit, you know, it was like you guys were close. Alabama, Alabama, I think maybe even played them the best out of anybody. You know, I thought for a while there, Alabama could have, you know, for a minute I'm thinking, are they, can they do it? You know, and then of course they do the UConn pull away and ended up winning by 14. But, uh, you know, I think Edie's got nothing to, to put his head down about. And I know I felt bad for him though, because they got Dave Revson and all these guys shoving mics in their face, you know, right after the game. And like, so how does it feel right now? Like, tell us, you know, it's like, what do you think? I mean, bad. <laughs> like, uh, let's see, um, deflated, uh, you know, I mean, and, and Russ, I know, I just want you to know, I was 18, but I remember vividly Illinois losing to North Carolina in the national championship game. I know how it feels. Okay. So, and, and as much as somebody's like, oh, blah, blah, we don't want to hear it. It's true though. When you get, and you're an Ohio state fan, JR, you know, you know, when, when, uh, they had Conley and Odin, you know. I hate Florida. I hate yeah, Florida. it's like you get Al there, this you're this close to that. My dreams. You're this close to ecstasy, you know. Yeah. And then it just, I know how it feels. So, so much to be proud of, though. I mean, and and I can't believe people are even talking about Painter could be done. Russ, is that something people are actually saying? 
I think I saw it once randomly, and I don't think it was even a non-Purdue fan. I think it was a Purdue fan that talked about, you know, maybe he maybe he decides he's had enough and retires or something. But it was it was no legitimate source. Nothing I think is ha- actually happening. But um, yeah, it's no, no. I don't I don't think so. I don't think so. I think he's done. I think that we make. I mean, the twenty twenty six Final Four is in Indianapolis. That'd be a heck of a Final Four to get back to, and maybe bring another Big Ten team or two and just kind of have the Big Ten take over a Indianapolis Final Four. That'd be pretty awesome. But. What's crazy is that he was this close to going to Missouri, what, about nine years ago? Wasn't that what it was? I, who knows how close that was? You know, I, I don't know. I'm not as you know close to the issue. And, you know, there's things that happen behind closed doors that who knows what happens. But we were definitely close to And he actually mentioned it kind of in the lead up to this Final Four that having that baby boiler recruiting class where he had the first two or three good years, if he didn't have that, when he had that year where we finished last in the Big Ten, he might have got run out of town. He might have gone – you know, to a Missouri or somewhere else that if it wasn't for that class. And that's, that's why he made sure to, ch- to thank Robbie Hummel and, and that class when we made the final four after beating Tennessee, he was like, look, every, every class and everything we've done to this point since he's been at, at Purdue led to this. Yep. Crazy. Crazy. All anything right. Well, going on in, anything going on in Fayetteville, uh, JR? Anything? Yeah. Yeah. We're going to talk about that one next. Uh, we do want to remind <laughs> you before we get into that, please do like the video. We appreciate it. 24 people in here on YouTube be excellent. If you would take the time to do that, it's free cost you nothing helps out the channel. So please do that. We appreciate it down in Fayetteville. They have hired John Calipari to be the new head coach at Arkansas. Uh, now we can talk all day long about John Calipari to Arkansas and go through that. If we want to, I have a bigger question, I think, which is our college basketball job still what they used to be right at one point in time, Kentucky was the biggest job in college basketball. That's where everybody wanted to be everything they were doing. I remember when I was in college, they broke out like that dorm that was just for basketball players. And uh, you had like your own personal chef there for the players. And like, it was only basketball players and girls and stuff like that. So it was like the place everybody wanted to be John Calipari. He won in 2012 and I went to school in Kentucky. So that was fun when I was uh, just getting into there as freshman, but you know, just a, Crazy, crazy time. Kentucky was the uh, just the best job in college basketball. Here we find ourselves 12 years later, and the Kentucky basketball coach is leaving for Arkansas. Now, we can say all we want about Arkansas, you know, has a booster with a lot of money and that kind of stuff, but I feel like something is changing here in college basketball. And, Ryan, I'm, I'm curious your thought on it. Let's start with this. Is Kentucky still one of or the best jobs in college basketball? I would say from a stature of, you know, relevancy of, you know, history, yes. But again, what's important to the man that's the coach? Because Calipari's leaving because of just the, the fan base, I think. And he knows that the NIL situation, too, he can go and make it easy. If he can go someplace – where it's going to be a lot easier for him, where he doesn't have to really delve into the NIL situation. Nowadays, like 10 years ago, I would say yes. Five years ago, probably. But, you know, I'm not sure anymore. I think it's more of where are you going to get the most NIL, but have less stress for the coach. Like there's a reason that Coach K is retired, that Bayheim's out of it, why Jay Wright left. It's this new NIL free agency is driving these guys crazy because you got to like examples. The Illinois coaches were preparing for an elite eight game and they got to do zooms with transfer portal kids, you know, like they're supposed to be focusing on the game, but they can't because if you get behind, you're done, you're screwed. All those teams that aren't playing, what do you think they're doing? You know, I think this is just a lot as as coaches get older and, and it's the reason that, you know, Brad Underwood's 60. Like, is he going to want to be doing this when he's 70? You know, it's not good for the heart. Uh, and um, Calipari wants to go somewhere where he can at least take one of those avenues out of the picture and having to worry about how much NIL or is he going to have to delve into it and go create and get more. He doesn't have to do that at Arkansas now. And I think more and more places – like an example would be Oregon and Phil Knight. They're not going to have any problems, I don't believe, with NIL. So there are jobs where you're looking at, like, what's funded here? Where does it funnel through? 
you know, and I don't know how that is at Kentucky, but it doesn't sound like it's something that, that, that Calipari wanted to deal with anymore. And that fan base, which I got to say, though, the fan base has every right to be upset with the, the, you know, how well the team has done the last three or four years, you know, when you're losing in the first round as a four seed or a three seed that there's reasons that the fan base should be upset when you have all the talent in the world and you have a great staff. So Calipari can't really use that, in my opinion, as an excuse because the fan base was upset with them. I just think it was getting toxic and he needed a place to go to get out of there where he doesn't have to worry about the NIL. Good points. What do you think, Russ? Yeah, I mean, it's still, you know, Kentucky's still a top five job in the country because they're going to get paid like a top five coach and they probably got top five coffers for NIL. So I, I don't I think the biggest change is what Ryan kind of alluded to there, which was the fan base in that social media makes these players and coaches so much more accessible. And these kids and these coaches see that, you know, and I know the 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 boomers and the oldies even might say, well, that's they're they're a power five division one athlete. They need to handle it. That's it comes with the territory. And it's like, you know, Painter even talked about it post the UConn loss and how amazing it is for these kids for Purdue to have, to have kept the roster together because when you lose a game, you go home, you look at Twitter and they're basically saying, Oh, he's a bum. He needs to not start. He needs to transfer. Or even you win a game and this is, you, you know, the Kentucky fan base is well known for this. You win a game and they're going, Oh, they should have won it by 30, not 12. They're terrible. They need to do this and switch this. This guy's terrible. I can't believe you kept letting him shoot. And what, you know, so it's, it's just so much more accessible. Like it used to be, you just dealt with it at the arena. You went home, played video games with the boys, you know, went and got something to eat, whatever. You didn't have to keep dealing with it, but it's still in everybody's face. And I think that has a, a bigger effect on the modern day transfer portal than NIO really does. Cause these players are going to make money pretty much everywhere at these major programs. You're just talking a difference of like, you know, is it 600,000 versus 400,000? Is it 1 million versus 750? Like, and you know, yes, a bigger figure may mean something to these kids, but I think a lot of these kids still want to win. You know, they don't want to go to, a lower university just to make an extra couple hundred thousand because their goal is still to make the NBA and make millions. Yeah. I mean, I think there's some guys that they know that their future is never really in the NBA, that they're going to be good college players. And so I do think NIL might matter a little bit more to those guys. Um, they caught from guy, North Carolina prime example. Yeah. Another guy that comes to my mind is uh, Robbie uh, Avil Avilia or whatever, however you pronounce his name, from Indiana State. It's Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, sir. I know, right? Um, probably yeah, going to say Those Lewis goggles now. do make it hard to decipher who it is. You're right. <laughs> yeah. Did you um, see his uh, – I looked him up on um, – I think it was 24-7 today to see if there's a crystal ball or anything, any news on him yet. His photo on 24-7 even looks like a Clark Kent photo. Like he's in it? a suit and everything. Like he looks all like it's like a LinkedIn profile picture. Like to check that out. So he needs a Clark Kent Superman type nickname now too. Yeah, that's awesome. To me, it was pretty obvious he was going to go follow his coach to slew Josh Shirts. You know, I think, and I, yeah. someone told me in, on his portal page, he has the do not contact sign up. It was like the you know the hotel do not disturb sign you put on your door. Yeah, uh, awesome. He put that on there like don't say shit to me, <laughs> excuse <Yeah>. me, <laughs> because uh, I don't don't say anything to me because I'm I'm going to slew so. Right. Um, so when we look at these college basketball jobs, and I know everybody wants us to talk about Illinois, we'll get to that in just a second. When we look at these college basketball jobs. All right. We look at North Carolina. They hired the next coach to be as somebody who was an assistant coach and Hubert Davis Duke. They did the same thing. They hired John Shire. You look at somebody like Syracuse, they hired, uh, what's his name, uh, Adrian Autry or something like that. Um, didn't have the most fantastic year this year. Uh, now his first year, so, you know, give him some credit there. But still, and now you have Kentucky looking at all these different coaches, and you got Dan Hurley saying, no, my wife's not going to let me go there. Billy Donovan says, I want to stay with the Chicago Bulls. I mean, like, are the best jobs in the country now, are they, are they the ones with the – Biggest NIL? Like, is it going to be Oregon that gets the best coaches? Is it going to be Arkansas who, who just has a donor that wants to see the basketball team win? Is it going to be somebody like Miami that's going to start having the best jobs because they have incredible NIL where they can just look at these players and pay them? I, I think you guys are right. I think that, you know, a lot of these players can go someplace and get, you know, money and, and play. But at a certain point, you can, you can only pay so many players, and so do coaches look at this and say, 
I'd much rather go someplace. Maybe I don't get paid as many millions of dollars, but if I have a five five uh, million dollar NIL war chest, that's uh, that's something that's really attractive to him. Russ, do you do you see that, or do you think that I'm just kind of out there and rethinking college basketball too much? I mean, I can see it both ways. I can see it both ways. I mean, you look at uh, there's still some basketball, kind of what we saw in football, really last year where. You know, somebody's coach gets stolen because they're going up, moving up high. So then they steal somebody else's coach and then they steal somebody else's coach and then they steal somebody else's coach. So that you still see a lot of that going on. I think it's just it's situation based. You know, if you're in a place like, you know, Dan Hurley's obviously won back to back NCAA championships at a, you know, power six school. You know, I know Big East, maybe sometimes it included with the power five, but, you know, UConn's now won six championships in the last 25 years. So they're, you know, I don't know. You know, yeah, if he if he wins a championship at at say like a a non powerhouse school like a Cincinnati or you know something like that, like I can see him saying, okay, let me move up to where there's more money. But obviously, he has the the tools to win. He probably lives quite the comfortable life, and he's probably not getting the hate that some of these other coaches are getting. And you know, UK UK is a it's a desirable job, but it's also a hotbed of scrutiny, right? Like you've got all eyes on you, and that that is a very critical fan base. And why would a coach that just won two national titles want to put himself in that situation if he's in a spot where he can win in a in a major conference? It might not be the Big Ten or the SEC or whatever, but it's still a major conference. So I, I think it's I think it's a situational based thing. Makes sense. Makes sense. Ryan, what do you think? Yeah, um, you know, I think here a couple of example too. You know, Kyle Neptune at Villanova. What kind of success has he had since Jay Wright left? Right. You know. Here's one. Uh, Brad Underwood left Oklahoma State, and they hired Mike Boynton. Okay, he has struggled majority of the years at Oklahoma State. The only year he didn't struggle is when they had Cade Cunningham. You know, and even uh, that, I feel like you could say that they were kind of under expectations with an in, in, NBA player like that on the roster, wouldn't you? Say? Yeah, I mean, I think they were a four or a five seed, but still, yeah. Like yeah. my point is, is, is that, you know. Every institution is different, but the, this assistant to head coach thing really hasn't really, you know, especially with the bigger programs, been super successful. I think going into, you know, like like a Michigan hiring a Dusty May, super smart in my opinion. You know, like I think he has proven um, his what he can do at FAU. I think they didn't go – and hire maybe some other Michigan man or whatever. I think that's a smart hire, you know, and, and it, the, the Ohio state ones is kind of odd for me, but I think Dabler Dabler earned it because he proved he, what he can do. I think with the end of the year, I think he's proven himself. It wasn't like he had never coached a game before and we're like, Hey, we're going to make you the coach. I think you, he got an audition to see like, what can he do? Uh, so other than that, I think it's, I think it's smart to hire guys that have had proven success and, and are working their way up uh, program wise, but definitely having a, a great NIL source doesn't hurt. Yeah. Makes it attractive for sure. So I'm surprised right, that a Purdue fan hasn't reminded you in the comments that Painter was a former player and a former assistant that got moved up and he just got us to the final four. So yeah, it can work out. Yeah. yeah. And I'm not trying oh, to say no, the no. assistant mm-hmm. like the assistant is a bad route. Obviously, it's worked out for Hubert Davis and for Matt Painter and stuff like that. But I was like, just speaking more on like the last five or six years. There's been tons more, I think, not working out than necessarily working out. There's never really a perfect answer to anything. So I mean, you know, I know Bruce Weber was a Purdue guy, right? I mean, he ended up working, you know, <laughs> Bruce, yeah. deep yeah. down. Yeah. Probably, yeah. yeah, he'll probably always be a boilermaker at heart. So. All right, we're going to run an ad really fast, and then we'll talk about Illinois Portal, and then after Illinois, we'll talk about Michigan Portal. So stick with us here for about a minute and a half, and then we'll come back. Looking to rep your alma mater or your favorite team in style? Look no further than Home Field. Home Field, based in Indianapolis, is your go-to destination for premium collegiate apparel. With a passion for comfort and a flair for vintage design, Home Field brings you officially licensed gear that is cozy as it is stylish. With over 150 colleges to choose from, Home Field digs deep into the archives, uncovering forgotten logos, iconic mascots, and legendary moments to create apparel that is truly one of a kind head on over to homefieldapparel.com use my code tbth for 15 percent off for news new customers or use my link in the description if you're a serious college basketball fan you need cbb 
Analytics. CB Analytics isn't just another stat site. It's the ultimate destination for in-depth basketball analysis. Used by fans and coaches alike, CB Analytics delivers stats that you won't find anywhere else. It has comprehensive stats for men's and women's basketball across Division 1 through 3, dating all the way back to 2018. From shooting percentages to game recaps, CBB Analytics has it all. Head on over to cbbanalytics.com with their user-friendly interface and extensive selection. You'll have all the stats you need right at your fingertips. Don't miss out. Try CBB Analytics for free or pay for your pro tier for your basketball knowledge to grow to the next level. CBB Analytics, where every stat tells a story and every game is a masterpiece. Welcome back. We have Illinois t- going into the portal. I forgot to bring that up. Illinois is going into the portal. They've lost a good amount of their roster so far this year. They've added two good portal additions, I would say. Trey White was very uh, highly touted out of high school. Now, I didn't do super well at Louisville, but also Louisville wasn't super good. So I don't know if you can really say anybody did all super well. There, So I don't know if I really take that against him. And Jake Davis was a a good shooter that I think will be a good piece for this Illinois team. But I'm sure Ryan has many opinions on both of them and has probably looked deeper into their their games than I have. So, Ryan, what are your thoughts on Trey White and Jake Davis? And we'll get into Storr and Boswell in a minute. Let's start with the White and Davis. So I will say Trey White necessarily – Trey White did – pretty well at Louisville it wasn't their best player actually Sky Clark former Illini was their best player but Trey White was right behind him I actually was watching the 12 minute highlight reel of his his highlights but I was it was more of like who was it against game and score how was he you know playing if they were down 20 was he moping you know like he looks like to me a guy who got better from year one at USC to year two at Louisville, you know, six foot seven shooting around 30% from deep 75% free throw shooter, six rebounds a game. I mean, there's a lot to work with there, you know, like that's not a guy that you're like, man, I don't know if he's got enough talent. What can we do with him? You know, very athletic as well. Not afraid to crash the boards. He's going to, he's going to be like a Ty Rogers that can shoot a three. Okay, like, you know, he's going to be a physical presence who can attack the rim, who you're going to see getting a lot of putbacks, who they're going to have to guard. They're not going to just say, oh, let's let Zach Eady stand in the paint. And, you know, uh, he'll be yeah, yeah, that, you know, that that was a big um, that was a big Achilles heel for him. Rogers is that uh, towards the end of the year, um, you know, he was missing some easy ones and then not making threes. So, um, but yeah, so Trey white love, I like the addition and I can tell you this with as many of these quality players is that they're having, they're coming uh, to campus in Champaign. They don't just want to, they're not just going to take anybody. It's not what I'm trying to tell you. Like they're, they don't, no one was forcing them to take Trey white. So if they're taking him, that means they really like what, what they're seeing and I like what I saw even from his one year at USC. I think he's going to be a nice piece off the bench, at least this first year. I don't believe he's going to start, um, but I think he's going to be a guy that's going to at least play 20 minutes. Now, Jake Jake Davis, okay, uh, yes, played at Mercer, but, you know, made 63 pointers as a freshman, true freshman. He made 63 pointers. Um, shot 85% from the free throw line, really good size. And, uh, I'm sure Russ, you, you know, he went to cathedral, you know, uh, and, and, and w- took the most charges in the state history of Indiana basketball. Um, so he's a tough kid, played football, won state titles, you know, really good size. Um, I'm just not sure if they cut his hair, if he's going to lose all of his power, you know? Like so he, he's got long, flowy, <laughs> blonde hair, you know, so we'll, we'll see how that works. But I, I like those additions definitely for, for coming off the bench. I think you're adding size, athleticism, rebounding and, and shooting. So uh, that's, and then Brad wants to keep all his guards and wings pretty much for the most part, the twos and the threes and the fours over six, six. And he's, and he's, and he's doing that so far. Um, and, and a huge weekend, JR. I know you probably want to 
talk a little transition with it, but you know, uh, Illinois has got some, some big time visitors this weekend and some coming uh, next week. So, you know, Kylan Boswell, as you mentioned, um, is visiting. Well, yeah, let's get to a question about uh, yeah, about go- White really fast, and then we'll we'll get into him. Ryan, do you think White can handle the ball like Rogers? Though, do you think he's going to be much of a ball handler? For um, I don't necessarily believe he's going to be a point forward, but yeah, he can handle the ball um, decently well. I mean, if you watch in all, of, if you watch his time from a 16 year old at the Macrovin Fire to just last year at Louisville. He's a guy that can bring the ball up, you know, and not, uh, you know, need to just give it away because he's got a guy in his face. So uh, I'm not necessarily worried about him handling the ball. He's not going to be a point forward, though. Mm-hmm. Um, but he's going to be a guy that, that's going to be able to handle the ball and, 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 you know, do what Brad and them need him to do. He might even be able to do a little bit of booty ball with uh, – like Damask did as well. It looks like he's got a nice ga- uh, mid-range game as well. Russ, looking at these guys, Trey White and uh, Jake Davis, obviously you're a little bit more on the outside looking in, but uh, but these additions of these two guys, obviously, like we were talking about, White a year at USC, uh, I think one year at USC, one year at Louisville. Yep. And yep. Um, I was going to say, I didn't think it was two years at USC. Um, but then Jake Davis coming in from Mercer. Obviously, they're going to bring in more guys than this. But just these two additions by themselves, what do you think, Russ? Yeah, I mean, you know, Trey White, I think he was all freshman Pac-12 team, too, his, his freshman year. So, yeah. you know, he's, he's shown some flashes. I don't think there was many defensive highlights on his Louisville film. Uh, I think I saw a comment in there about his uh, – some of his lack of hustle. Um, and so, you know, we'll see if Underwood can can get into him and, and turn that around. But, you know, I, I know we talked about Coach Cal and, and kind of the the method he used it at UK with the one and done freshman. And I, I don't know how it feels to kind of be an Illinois fan that that they're kind of the middle of the road revolving door. Instead of having freshmen that leave for the NBA or whatever, they're they're getting these transfers that are, you know, after one or two years, they're coming in and then they're, they're transferring guys out like Dane Danger. And it sounds like Coleman Hawkins isn't even coming back, but, but might be looking at playing somewhere else possibly if he doesn't go to the NBA draft. And, you know, I know they're, it seems like maybe Domask, they're not expecting him to win. If they're doing after this many transfers, I don't think they're expecting him to, to come back. And so, I mean, it's, it's just, it's a lot like they've got to replace, I mean, they're getting good pieces, but you're talking about losing Damask, Terrence Shannon Jr. And Coleman Hawkins, do these guys, are they going to come close to replacing that level of production? And are they all going to work out and are they going to mesh well? Because some of these guys like AJ store had a great season at Wisconsin, you know, he had pretty much all he could want as far as being able to, to play his game. Is he going to get that at, at Illinois? Like these, you know, and like I said, with, with Davis, there's, there's some hustle issues and, you know, or not, sorry, with White, there's hustle issues. With Davis, he's coming from Mercer. Is he going to be able to make the step up and produce? So, I mean, it's it's just a – I think it's a big gamble to – I love the devil's advocate, Russ. Love it. What's that? I love the devil's advocate. <laughs> well, and, and it's just – it's there's something to be said. And obviously, as a Purdue fan, I'm, I'm more partial to the, you know, stack recruiting classes, develop dudes, don't let them leave, don't take in a lot of transfers. But when you do this transfer game, you always take the risk that it doesn't work out. And you're taking a new risk like every year. And at some point – it's not going to work out. You know, maybe, maybe he does always make it, make it work out to some extent, but you know, you're taking a risk every single year as opposed to going, okay, I know this guy is going to steadily step up production each year. Okay. This guy's going to take that guy's role. So, I mean, I don't know how it feels as an Illinois fan to, to be tracking all that. It can be exciting, I guess, because you're like, okay, what are, what toys are we going to get to play with or, or for this year? But yeah, that's, that's so, the one concern I'd have. <clears throat> yeah. So in regards to that, like, I'm not sure really, I hadn't heard much of the, and trust me, I keep my ear to the to this daily. So, the Hawkins thing is, um, I think he's just ready to be done and wants to go on to pursue the NBA thing, and we'll see what happens. He's going to go do the combine and and see and put his best foot forward, and uh, you know, I, and I have more power to him. We we love Coleman, and if he wants to go uh, play professionally and be done with college more. I mean, he's accomplished a whole lot and I think he is ready to just be a pro. And if, if he wants to come back, I can promise you Illinois would bring him back. And if they are going to add someone to replace him, which they have to, you have to recruit though. Like someone's not coming back, especially when it's the, is he's going to go trap, you know, test the NBA waters. You can't just say, well, we're not recruiting somebody for Coleman. So, you know, we, if he doesn't come back, we're screwed, you know, because that actually happened a few years ago with a certain player. 
uh, where they were like, oh, yeah, he'll be back, you know, and then, oh, he was not back, and, oh, we don't have great depth. Uh, so, and then with Damask, they're really trying hard. He's hired an attorney. He's hired attorneys to see if he can get that sixth year because he only played 10 games in 2019. And then the, when COVID happened in March, that cut their season short. They didn't have a postseason. So, you know, he didn't, he could, he would have been under that 30% threshold or whatever to get a, to get a uh, red shirt. So that's kind of what they're looking at now. I think they think it's, it's unlikely, not impossible. So they are definitely recruiting as if he's not coming back because I think you have to put yourself in the, in the best predicament to succeed. And so far, Brad has done that pretty well. I think three or four years in a row, you know, they've, Three of the last four years have been pretty good with it. Two years ago, oddly enough, when you're saying, you know, stacking classes, that year where it was a bunch of high school recruits really is the year where it, they got screwed kind of. So, you know, they were – Not everybody can recruit like Painter. It's okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. <laughs> Kofi, Io, you know, I can continue to phrase your week. Anyway, it's fun. It's hey, fun. They're picking up on it. Classic <laughs> Illinois versus Purdue battle. Who says there is a rivalry? <sighs> This is the kind yeah. of stuff you get on the on the uh, college huddle. So that's the kind of stuff we like. That's right. But. Yeah, exactly. That's what that's what we're doing it. But uh, so as as he brought up, unless you want to Jr. You want to segue me to the AJ Store Boswell stuff. That's fine. Yeah, so, sure. Um, when it, we can get into that, AJ Store. He's been uh, linked with uh, predictions from a couple of different. I think twenty four seven was the one that gave him a prediction to go to Illinois. I haven't seen a prediction for Boswell yet. Have you seen a prediction, Ryan, or is that? Yes, um, Eric Bossy actually put in his his prediction, Kylan okay. Boswell, uh, to Illinois. And um, I just want to make it so we're all on here, and this is recorded, and I'm going to actually tweet about it. And, you know, if you want to use the huddles and say, you know, Ryan is his, his saying, Kylan Boswell to Illinois, I'm going to say it right now. I've been told by everybody that makes me me and my sources – Kylan Boswell is going to be in Illini. He's visiting tomorrow. No, he's visiting Friday. So dead period still going on tomorrow. So Friday, he's going to be in Champaign. And in case anybody didn't know this, who's watching this, Big Ten fans or people, anyone else, he was actually born and raised in Champaign, as everybody knows this. His dad went to Illinois. His mom has family there in Champaign still. Um, he chose to go to Arizona, you know, for a few different reasons. They moved out west in his teen years. It wasn't like anything to say, screw Illinois. I'm not, but I think it just it ended up working out, and it's going to work out in Illinois' favor. And I think he's going to be a guy that's going to be a state a steadying, stable influence handling the ball. You know, I see people like, oh, he struggled in some of their big games. You know, he also had some really good games in some of their big games. You know, he's still very young, too, if everybody – he's still 18 years old, okay? So he's been playing major college basketball <laughs> since he was 17, and he's going to be a junior who's going to be 19 years old. I think his best ball is very well ahead of him, and I think all those experiences at Arizona are going to do him well in his last couple years uh, once he ever – he announces uh, he's coming to Illinois. Um and so that's just what I've been told. So for anybody out there, everybody loves to, you know, make their fun little predictions or whatever. Uh, so I've got been told Kylan's coming to Illinois. They also have a couple other big time AJ store. There's no visit yet from him because the NBA draft wa waters are, or really what he's focusing on right now, because I think he wants to really improve and work on his game. And uh, kind of like what Terrence Shannon did last year, he went to the, you know, the combine and everybody was like, you know, sure. You could, if you stay in this, you could probably be a late second round pick with how athletic you are, but you really need to work on your three point shooting. You just need to focus on that, you know, and uh, Terrence Shannon improved, you know, to near 40% three point shooter this year. You know, he jumped like seven percentage points. I think he's, that's why as long as all his legal issues are, are, are taken care of, which, I know everybody outside of Illinois, you know, likes to talk about it, but inside the Illinois circle, everybody is feeling pretty confident that things are going to get cleared up. So 
Uh, I think that's what Store is looking at. He wants to see where he's going to grade out, what he needs to work on, and probably just be a one-year guy. And I think most people would take a second-team All-Big Ten guy to come into your team, uh, especially showing that type of the type of talent uh, that AJ Store is. And I think Brad Underwood's the kind of guy that's not going to let you come out there and not play hard. That's not going to happen. You know, there are times where maybe the defense this year was not great, but if you weren't hustling and you weren't diving on loose balls and you weren't trying your best, he would sit you on the bench. Plenty. Of, he, he sat Coleman for a half, you know, so he, he'll do it if he needs to. But uh, I'm super excited about what they're doing with the portal. I think Illinois, I don't know if you guys knew this or not, but they lost Jace Butler. The They had Jace Butler committed, who was a rising kid from California. You know, Underwood's trying to do the high school route some, but I think some kids just don't want to compete. And they see all these names like Kylan Boswell and AJ Store, and that scares them. You know, it's like, hey, you're committed to Illinois, but once the season's over, Illinois still needs to replace people. They can't be dependent on just freshmen to, like, run the show. You still need a veteran guard. But some of these freshmen don't want to compete. You know, for, for your sake, Russ, I'm happy that Braden Smith was like, I'm going to, I'm just going to do my thing and I'm not worried about who else is there and I'm going to play. And if I'm better than this guy, then, then that's how it is. But not every class and not every team get that, you know, mm-hmm. and, and that's kind of what's happened with Illinois on some of these kids. You know, they just don't want to stick it out. You know, Sky Clark was an example, super talented, super talented. He got benched for a one one half against Northwestern had a little bit of a skirmish behind closed doors with Matthew Meyer. And then he's out, you know, real life adversity happens and and you're going to see who, what someone's really made of. And that's why Sky Clark left Illinois. It wasn't because, Oh, he couldn't stand Brad. Or if you notice, he only says really good things about Brad Underwood because he knew Brad Underwood gave him the keys to his program and he dipped on him midway through the year. You know, so I think that's why Brad's like Brad did say that will never happen to him again. He's never going to be dependent on a few freshmen to lead his team because nowadays you can just leave and go play somewhere else next year. Um, yeah, it's the unfortunate part of college basketball. I, I think that some of it is the unwillingness to compete, and I also think that some of it is also that these guys see that if I go to a smaller school, I can go to Southern Illinois and get picked up by Purdue and Illinois and go be somebody who's a title contender, right? I mean, that's what Domas did. That's what Lance Jones did. <laughs> Both those guys came to big-time Big Ten programs after playing well uh, at their smaller program and were inserted into teams. I mean, I think Illinois was a title contender this year. I I know some people would probably argue with that, but whatever, argue with a wall. I think that they were still a title contender. But, um, but you look at it and you say these were the two best teams in the Big Ten this year. And they picked up guys from smaller programs, and I think sometimes the freshmen see that. Um, I think that Purdue, whatever Matt Painter is doing, is a really good job of getting those guys to come in and be willing to sit for a year and kind of learn. Some guys, maybe, some guys might, you know, get a little bit more playing time. But, uh, Russ, as far as the A.J. Store and Kylan Boswell situations look like, I've heard everything under the sun. I've heard Boswell's coming, but Store's not. I've heard Store's coming, but Boswell's not. I've heard everything uh, that that's out there, but uh, I'm not asking you to make a prediction, but I am asking you your thoughts on if Illinois got one or both or neither of them. What are your thoughts? Yeah. I mean, I, I just go back to my comment of, you know, if, if I'm an Illinois fan or just kind of an out, you know, a completely impartial non Purdue fan, just looking at the situation um, I'm looking at, you know, what have we lost and what are we replacing it with? So if I'm an Illinois fan, I'm, I'm going, we, we need, and I, I definitely help, but we really need store and Boswell because, you know, like I said, losing Shannon, losing Damask, and losing Hawkins, possibly you're going to need a lot of production to replace that. You know, yeah, you've got other guys and support pieces coming back that maybe they step into a bigger role, but you've got you've got to be able to fill those spots and fill that production to be able to even repeat what you did. You know, let alone if you're going to try to improve on on what run they made this year. Um, one last one before we jump to Michigan portal. Uh, Carrie Booth from Notre Dame uh, is just so people know, is the Coleman Hawkins replacement in case things don't work out or they feel like as of now that Hawkins is going to leave. So if they take a a commitment from Kerry Booth from Notre Dame, who, by the way, Micah Shrewsbury loves, okay, he's literally Coleman Hawkins. He's 6'10", 2'10", right now. 
He's a, he just played his first year at Notre Dame, shoot, you know, shooting in this mid to upper 30s from three. The Illinois staff loves him. He's going to be on campus this weekend as well with Kylan Boswell. So I'm telling I'm, you. I'm curious, Ryan. Do you want another Coleman Hawkins or would you rather another Kofi Co- uh, Cokeburn? Um, yeah. Because uh, Coleman is super hilarious. versatile and could do so many things. But Kofi, I mean, he was that down low presence that, you know, could really bang oh, with some of those big hey. guys in the Big Ten. I mean, I, both are great options. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying either one's a bad option. I'm just yeah. curious. Your, I just, your thoughts. I, and, and, I, and I'm going to give you them here in a sec. But Illinois is also going to be recruit, getting a, a five, an actual five in the portal. So Dane Danger left. They've got like five. They got five, they got you know what's that? They got the wood and the fire on about five to ten big men. They know they have to have a presence down there. You can't just there's Coleman Hawkins served his purpose very very well this year. And let's just be honest too. Even they finished second in the regular season, won the Big Ten tournament title, got to an Elite Eight. So for anybody who might say, you know, one twenty nine game. So if anyone else would be like Illinois didn't have a low post presence. No, they really didn't, and I think we did just fine. Okay, I right. think I'm not I saying there's say, anything wrong with it. I think Danger's low post presence was a big part of their late season push, though. I wouldn't I just would dismiss that. Say that again. I said I think Danger's low post presence was a big part of that run in the postseason, though. Yeah, so I, I mean, yeah, that, I would right? say he very, very helpful. Correct, but also, um, what was it? They had won 23 games prior to that, so. You know what I mean? But it's he 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 had his moments and he had his teams that you just knew he couldn't play with. Like if he was getting doubled, you couldn't play him because Northwestern was a team that was going to post trap and he was going to turn the ball over. That's why he didn't play against Northwestern. So um, but yeah, so I would personally take another Coleman Hawkins because I think the talent was always there. And I just got used to the kind of. Oh, I didn't foul the guy. Like every day, every game we knew like he was going to do his thing. Like he didn't foul anybody. And while I'm sure it annoyed other fan bases, Illinois fans were plenty annoyed with it. Yeah. (laughs) Illinois fans were plenty annoyed with it. But at the end of the day, we kind of saw a guy who, you know, was shooting near 40% from three and all was a very, very effective defensive player. as, As long as you weren't over 260 pounds. Uh, if, you, if you looked at his, yeah. defense, I'm just being honest, Russ. That's what I was going to say when when uh, Jr. asked that question. I was like, "Well, Edie had his way with Kofi and with with Hawkins, so it'd be interesting to hear which one they'd prefer." Oh, stop! <laughs> <laughs> he didn't have his way with Kofi. I will say this: they had. I go back and look at some of those box scores. Yeah, I, I did. <laughs> I, I know. I remember very well. And one of them, Kofi couldn't even play because he was concussed. So, and that was the Martin Luther King Jr. Day in Champaign that you guys won in overtime. Uh, but they were actually really evenly matched for the most part. But, yes, Edie got the better of him uh, in his final season. But Hawkins, very effective. Uh, his efficiency, if you look, though, there's a chart out there that said he was top 15 in defensive efficiency. I mean, if you really look at that stuff, if you care about that stuff. I don't know. There's numbers, guys, out there. Um, but uh, so, yes, I'd be fine with – a guy like Booth, who's going to be a Coleman Hawkins type. But it, remember, too, now the staff's not done recruiting a five. They know they have to get a big because Danger's, uh, Danger's at Memphis now. So just yeah. wanted to post that up here for any Illini fans watching that may not be aware of it and any other Big Ten fans that may care uh, that Illinois is going to have Kerry Booth from Notre Dame coming. I was kind of surprised he left, you know, yeah. Michael Shrewsbury. And, and it sounds like maybe Mason Gillis could be a – could be an option because I know Shrews and him are that that was his guy, you know. Yeah, yeah. I was at that game too, and uh Shrews and Penn State came to Mackey and, and Gill set the three point record and and Shrews was kind of like, dude, Mason, like I thought we was thought we was dudes, like, why you gotta do that to me when I come to town? Yeah. So yeah, I, I think it'd be awesome if he and Morton both went to Notre Dame. Good yep. stuff. Good stuff. All right, let's move on. Let's talk a little bit of Michigan. Uh, new coach, Dusty May, he uh, has Michigan trending for some high-level transfers. John L. Davis, Vlad Golden, and Danny Wolf. Uh, also, Roddy Gale from Ohio State. So, might get uh, one of the guys from coming up from uh, the southern state to 
come up north and join the Wolverines up there. Uh, Russ, let's go to you first. Do you think Michigan will land all three? I mean, are they going to get the the lottery here where they get all three of these transfers? Maybe you think they get one or two. Uh, is there anyone else you think that uh, Michigan is looking at that they might land? I mean, it, it's looking that way. I mean, especially considering two of them played for him. Um, so it, it's almost like a, it kind of reminds me of, I spent a lot of years in the restaurant business and you, you interview a manager and one of the, the pushing points or talking points of, of them trying to get the job is, well, I've got this staff of like three or four people that are, they've, they've followed me everywhere. They're really good employees. They're going to work real hard. They're going to really improve the company, not just myself. Like, so that's, it's almost like that's becoming that way a little bit when you have a coach that moves up that has a good, a good season at a team that's a mid or low major that makes a sweet 16 or even an FA use case, a final four run, they're going to interview you and be like, okay, you know, we're excited about you. We're excited about the potential, but Hey, you're bringing those two dudes with you too. Right? Like, so I, he, sh he should land those two. And it looks like, you know, they're pretty much a lock to get, um, I just lost my notes here. Uh, Danny Wolf from Yale, but you know, it's, it's a, it's a step up in competition for all of them, right? Going from, from where they've gone to the big 10, especially the Ivy league to the big 10, you know, we'll see what happens. And he he needs it's a numbers game. When you when you come into a new program, you're going to lose commitments if they even had any, depending on what the coach left in the coffers. Um, and you're going to have to try to turn that program around quick because they're not going to give you long. Now, Michigan has the advantage of they care way more about football than basketball. It's almost like they begrudgingly said, OK, fine, we'll fire Juwan Howard. We'll act like we care about the basketball program. So maybe that's why he preferred to go there instead of a Louisville where he knew he had more time. But. Uh, I, I think he's a, he's a good shot at landing those three, and you know, Roddy Gale would be would be a great addition as well. But yeah, you know, I think those three for sure. Wash your mouth out with soap, Russ. Don't say I Roddy think, Gale. yeah. <laughs> so, hey, what are you gonna do, think, Ryan? Jr. What are you gonna do if Roddy Gale's playing for the Maize and Blue? I'm gonna be doing the same thing I'm doing with uh, Tony Alford, the running back coach, going up there. I'm gonna be like, just let's beat him and make him regret his decision. <laughs> you are wearing a blue and gold uh, sweatshirt there. JR yeah, this is my me. Pacers. This is my Pacers. <laughs> I wore this on a podcast with Eric earlier and almost gave him a heart attack. So, <laughs> um, I am uh, one thing I don't think that we're really mentioning too is like, so you see guys like Eric Musselman going to USC. I think one thing that's not really being discussed a lot of why these guys are so intrigued and want to come to the Big Ten is the money, like, yeah. and the, from the TV deals. I mean, I'm just saying, like, it's huge. Like, the way that these TV deals and networks, it's just crazy the amount of money and that they got coming in from this. And I think Dusty May knew like, yes, the ACC is a, is ESPN's darling, but it's really where the money's really with the big 10. It just is yeah. like you, you I got mean, that helps NIL and everything else too. So these players, yeah. Vlad, Danny, John L, anybody else that comes like they should be making good NIL. I know there's rumors going around about Michigan's NIL right now. I don't know how much to believe about that, but uh, you would think the basketball team should have a good stockpile after this last season to go out and get some guys. You're right. Money's a big talking point. So, yeah, and I, I believe they're going to get two of the three. Illinois is actually after Danny Wolf. He's one of the five that uh, big men I was talking about. I didn't really want to say it out loud, but, you know, mm -hmm. you uh, <laughs> but you brought him up, and I, will, I know Michigan's going hard after him. I, I would just be surprised because – if they get both of those guys, one of them starting and one of them saying, I'm cool not to be the guy, you know, like Illinois needs a, a five. So right. to me, hey, we can give you pretty much the same money, but you're going to start or you're going to compete against Vlad Golden. Who do you who do you what do you want to do? So I think two of the three. And it wouldn't surprise me either if you get add Rudy uh, uh, Gale as well. So, um, not to, to rub that in your nose at all, but uh, it is what it is. It's JR, who else? So, is Thornton staying? Akpara is pretty much everybody else staying. Is, is Gail the only? I saw Scotty Middleton, right? Yeah, Gail and Scotty left. Um, please, Scotty, don't go up to Michigan. <laughs> it would really break my heart because I think Scotty's <laughs> going to be a better player than Roddy. And I mean, no disrespect to Roddy, I just I think that. Scotty has a really bright future. Um, but, yeah, Bruce and everybody's going to stay, and I think that they're going after Bronny right now. We'll see what happens with that. and then, uh, But I think he's probably more uh, Duquesne than uh, Ohio State based off LeBron James's connections and that kind of stuff. So I actually think Michigan's going to kill it in the portal, and they're going to make Ohio State look bad because Ohio State, at the end of the day, is going to only have so many options 
open and you know Michigan has all, all these options open and they're going to be able to get these guys from FAU so I'm kind of with you Ryan I feel like it it's between Vlad Golden and Danny Wolf I feel like you, there's no way Danny Wolf goes now Danny Wolf is younger I think Vlad only has one year of eligibility left and I think Danny still has two after this year so uh, I think that there is a possibility there that they bring both in but I mean in today's day and age after the season Danny Wolf had I feel like he could go to a lot of different places like in Illinois and Indeed. go ah. there and start, you yeah. know, and like you said, make the similar amount of money. So I don't know. We'll see. Uh, we'll see what happens there. I feel like Vlad and John L are the most likely ones, but I've also seen predictions for Danny to go there too. But um, so Russ, if Michigan does bring in say two of these three or these three, and then they add a few other pieces like a Roddy Gale, like some other pieces that are, good maybe not you know star players out of the portal but good pieces do you think michigan has a roster that will be able to put them in the top half of the big 10 next year because that'd be pretty pretty great improvement for dusty may in my mind yeah well um you know welcome to the big 10 the four new programs and i won't call any of them out by name but i think that three of the four new programs will be the basement in the big 10 and the basement kind of raises for the teams that are traditional you know big 10 schools and if, if he's able to bring guys with him and turn it around pretty quickly, I wouldn't be surprised to see, you know, 10 or 11 teams from the Big Ten make it. And I think Michigan could find their way to the bottom end of the, those number of teams because there's a lot of guys that are, that are leaving this year in the Big Ten, right? Not just the Purdue, the Illinois, and the Ohio States that we're talking about. You know, I think there's the, the path there for Michigan to become relevant. And, you know, Dusty Mays come back to some of this, well, what if I have to sit on the bench, is he's a Final Four coach very recent final four coach. And if you're going to make the final four, you've got to have starter level players coming off the bench. You just do like, you've got to have that talent. And like you said, you know, Vlad's got one year of eligibility left, whereas Wolf's got two. So is it something where, you know, Vlad might be the, the guy that kind of try to run it through more this year, but then they transition to Wolf and then he's a, he's the star next year, you know? So I think there's still a pitch there to be able to have both those guys. And if he can do that, you know, and, and depending on what he does with the rest of the class, he, they definitely could be a tournament team this year. Oh, yeah, I think a tournament team, I think he's got the coaching chops to do that. And I know they are losing some some quality players. Well, Terrace Reed is the one I was I liked the most out of that, that group. I think he had the most uh, – he's got the most highest ceiling. I think he's got, you know, a really good free throw shooter, plus he's got a big body and he's athletic around the rim. I mean, I like Terrace Reed. Uh, I think Terrence Williams, while he had decent stats – don't really love his game. Doesn't really like. Didn't never really liked how he carried himself. Kind of nonchalant, you know. Kind of just loafed around. Shatter, I think, is a name that they're they're keeping. That's a big ad. To keep you know a guy that, that's. I think he should have played more. I think Juwan surprised Juwan Howard didn't play him more. I know a lot of Michigan fans were always curious as to why he didn't, but. Uh, yeah, so I think Dusty May can get them to the tournament. I still think it's super early, though, for all these teams, especially, you know, I think people know that Purdue is going to have a good, young, nice core coming back. But don't sleep with Illinois on their portal additions. I think when when, when it's all said and done and, and Illinois has got their, their roster locked and loaded for next year, I know Brad's going to have to conform it together. But he did it this year. You know, I think he's shown that he can do that. And I think he's learned a lot from the last – from two years ago about – the temperament of certain players and and uh i think he's he's got it figured out now so much yeah. of bringing these guys in from the portal is just bringing them in and creating good culture too because that's yeah. that's one thing that dan hurley has been able to do and other coaches have been able to do is when you bring these guys in from the portal if you're able to sustain a good culture it's easier for a team like purdue where you keep a lot of your guys you bring in one transfer only one transfer last year right correct yeah we've only had two in the last four years so yeah yeah. Uh, so obviously that, that culture is going to stay, but uh, Brad Underwood definitely has it cut out for him. But like you said, he did it this year. So why not believe in him that he can do it again? So um, we'll definitely see if Dusty May can, uh, can live that life with the transfer portal. He did it with uh, two, he did it uh, getting to the tournament two years, getting to the final four one year with about the same group of guys. This will be kind of his test and uh, we'll see where it goes from there. Um, Let's go ahead. We do have one question that I think is pretty interesting. And uh, Russ, I guess if you don't want to, <laughs> if you don't want to say it, you don't have to. But 
Phillip's wondering now, which three teams miss the Big Ten tournament? Are they the three you're talking about from the Pac-12, Russ? Or uh, who are some of your teams that might be in danger of missing the Big Ten tournament next year? Yeah, I think that, you know, USC made a great hire to try to avoid being one of those teams because they were definitely one of those that was headed that direction. But I think Oregon and Washington are, are definitely going to be in for a rude awakening coming to the Big Ten. Yeah. And it just kind of depends on what some of these programs like this Penn State you know, make a step or do they slide down? Does Michigan do a good job? Does he do a good job, Dusty May, of, you know, rebuilding that program quickly? Um, what does this Rutgers team look like? You know, are they a team that needs a year to, to figure out how to work together or do they come in firing on all cylinders? So, you know, I, I think those are kind of some of the candidates for yeah, sure in the yeah, bottom. Because Griffiths and Cliff Omaruyi hit the portal, man. I'm thinking you guys stay. I think they were going to be tough next year, you know? Yeah. yeah. And Jeremiah Williams is still there. I'm thinking, man, you guys are going to be – I like it. You got to mix of old and young. And, I mean, they, nah, not this day and age, baby. I'm hitting the road. You know, I, I think, sadly, the NIL at, at, at Rutgers is, is the problem. I know that um, Bailey and Harper are coming, but but trust me, you that's where the money's going. Yeah. Yeah, you got to bring the star guys in. Um, I agree with you, Russ. I think that Oregon and uh, Washington are going to be two of the lower seeded teams. And unfortunately for Penn State, I just I don't see them adding the necessary star talent to be able to to get out of down there. I think that they built a lot of good stuff this season. They went nine and eleven in the conference, which you know a team who's sixteen and seventeen going to nine and eleven in the conference. It's obviously a good thing for them, but at the end of the day, I, I, I am concerned about them losing their guys and what Mike Rhodes is currently doing in the portal. I haven't heard him adding some of the guys that you would think would need to be added to, uh, you know, at least raise yourself up to the middle of the pack in the Big Ten. So Think about Northwestern. Think about what they're losing. They are losing a lot. Yeah. Okay. But Ty Bear is coming back. And no more Casey in uh, Nebraska. So uh, think of, yeah, you got, <laughs> you got Bowie's gone. You've got Lang, Lang, Langer, Langborn. Langborn. He, he's not coming back. Um, and yeah, you got, okay, you're going to have Barry, Barnheiser, and uh, uh, Nicholson, I think. Is Nicholson. Okay. Yeah. I mean, let's, what, what was Northwestern without Bowie this year? You That's going to be the biggest thing is can they replace Bowie and can they bring somebody in to, you know, really run that offense? Because I think Chris Collins has a good offense. I think that he really does run those guys well. It's just, you know, does he have the right guy to come in and run that offense? You just got to have a generational player to come on in and, uh, you know, <laughs> just be the best go player. Go grab a generational history, player. You know? yeah. <laughs> go turn All the right. Florida 36th rank recruit into a two time national player of the year. It's easy. Everybody can do yeah. it. Yeah. No, no problem. Yeah. Uh, all right. Hey, thanks, guys, for coming in here and uh, talking up this stuff. Thank you, everybody, for listening. We appreciate it. Russ, uh, you want to tell people where they can find Boulder Express at? Uh, yes, sir. Thanks for having us on, JR. I uh, appreciate it. You can find Boulder Express anywhere you find podcasts or your uh, audio media, just search Boiler Express. We're at Boiler underscore Express on Instagram and Twitter, or X as they call it, but we're also on YouTube and Facebook. When we go live, you can find us there as well. Very good. Ryan, you want to tell people when they can find Keeping It Orange and Blue? That's right. You can find us on X with my uh, at 200 Columns Rye. I'm always live streaming every episode. Uh, YouTube at 200 Columns. Uh, 200Columns.com is the website that uh, – I've been running for years and it's it has all our episodes on there. It's on Apple podcasts and Spotify. <clears throat> and now proud, proudly very easily found on the college huddle. Yeah. Yeah. Seriously guys, go check out the college huddle.com. Eric Boggs, our OHIO podcast guy. He has killed it with the podcast uh, or not the podcast. Well, he's killed it with the, podcast the website. Too, the website. Everything. The website looks fantastic, guys. Um, there is a background right now that will be changed because it's a soccer background because the web developer <laughs> is not super big sports guy. So we'll get that changed. But uh, Eric Eric has killed it. A lot of great stuff uh, over there. And uh, it's really, really cool. So check I'm out the college huddle. Proud to be a part of it. A long time coming. We had to keep our mouths shut for months. <laughs> You know, I felt like, you know, I was like, had this big weight on my shoulders. I'm like, I can't talk about it. I can't, I can't talk about it. Okay. No, no but it's yeah. Free now, Ryan. Excited. Free now. excited. Yep. Very good. All right. Hey, thank you everybody for watching. We appreciate it. Thank you, Russ. Thank you, Ryan. Have a great night, everybody. And we'll see you next time. ILL.